Hi, and thank you for tuning in to the Fight is Old podcast. I'm Seth, and in this first episode, I talk with a person I highly admire for his ability to organize his vision into working organization. Richie Crani is a MMA vice president, creator of MMA training program Win to Warrior, an internationally recognized MMA coach. We talk about Win to Warrior program and how MMA changes lives, women in MMA mental trainings, and how the world of amateur MMA is rising to absolutely new level under IMF. I hope you enjoy and learn from this episode as much as I did. Why do we fight? To protect home and family. To preserve balance and bring harmony. For our kind, the true question is, what is worth fighting for? The Fight Is All podcast. Here we go. <laughs> we are live. <laughs> yeah, busy days. Yes, very busy. Yeah, so just to start with, uh, and I asked the other coaches the same the same question. Uh, can you just give a give a bit of background, uh, like sure. about your uh, how you get involved in the combo sports? Yep. And how this lead you to coaching and apparently went to war and 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 yeah, MMF. Yeah, for sure. Um, so grew up in London. Um, West London, um, just a state Catholic school, not much sport, um, it's basically football, or you guys call it soccer over here, um, or boxing. So I started to box because um, I was, when I moved to the big school, I, I was the only one from my, my junior school that went, I was terrified about being bullied, you know, by the big boys. So I thought, I'm just going to box and then anyone messes with me. We're not very small. Was you, was you a, uh, as small as I a was kid? Never, yeah, I was just average, I guess, but yeah. Um, so yeah, took up boxing, boxed for um, close to probably three years uh, in school. Um, we had uh, an amazing boxing coach called Bruce Wells, who was back in the day, this is going back before, see. I was born probably, but um, he was a European heavyweight champion. So good pedigree. Um, and, but that was my first real introduction to um, a disciplined environment. You know, he'd check your nails, for instance. And if you'd been biting your nails, he'd put this, I don't even know today what it's like, a varnish. And you put your fingers anywhere near your mouth, it's disgusting. So he, it was just this thing, you know, and when he spoke, everyone shut up. Like, but. In school, I was I was a bit of a naughty kid, you know. We didn't listen to teachers, but you listened to your boxing coach, and um, I really appreciate that structure because um, I struggled. I really struggled at school. I had some learning difficulties and stuff, um, dyslexia, and and it, which wasn't picked up. So I always struggled, and then I would go to school and I'd leave school early and get into fights and stuff. So boxing was a real saviour for me. And I left school. Um, I missed that structure, you know, I was a teenager uh, with a car, um, being stupid, driving around, getting into trouble, um, and yeah. Was getting a little, of course, a little bit of fighting there? Uh, a little bit, a little bit fighting. Never, I never went out looking for fights, but I would never shy away from one. Um, if one of my mates got started, or there was a lot of fighting back then in London, you know, there was, it would be rare to go out on a Friday or a Saturday night and not be a fight somewhere. Um, okay. And when you're with three or four mates, normally one of us would get sucked into it, and then everyone's in. So, used to used to had a, had a few fights. Anyway, so, but I, it, you know, there was this path. You know, I could really see there was this pathway of, of, um, in the UK where I'm from, is a lot of people just ending up in jail. Um, and I wasn't doing anything stupid, but you know, just kid stuff. Um, but. Um, a good friend of mine, her brother, had started a martial arts academy, um, and it was called Choi Karate or Choi Kwon Do, which was the the break off from Master Choi from Taekwondo. Um, anyone doesn't know, so uh, Master Choi was the World Federation leader of Taekwondo back in the day, um, and he broke off, went to the US to create a more streetwise martial art. So the no locking movements, you know, much more fluid clinch work, knees, elbows, punching like boxers. Um, it, it, uh, sorry to interrupt mm. you, but is that uh, like ITF Taekwondo? Like the, the no, it's something completely else? different. I, I never heard about yeah, it. Yeah, Choi Kwon Do. So um, in the UK, we just called it Choi Karate because it was a much more easier way to sell your, your gym. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was basically um, some of the kicks transferred over, but there was no locking of any joints at all. 
Um, your stance is much more like a boxer and all your punches were fluid. Um, a lot of, um, there was a lot of sports science that went into it. So it was all about kinetic energy and sequential movement and flowing um, rather than short, sharp movement, which always after boxing as an early, as a kid through school, I see these cry guys, it's like, this is bullshit. You know, I've, I've, in my mind, I'd been taught how to punch properly and I wasn't going to go backwards to talk how to, to yeah. do something that just wasn't, it wasn't streetwise and I just didn't like it. So I started with Choi Karate um, and then it was, I immediately found that structure that I'd missed in my life. Um, that regiment training, uniform, gi, belt system, back to having an instructor that, you know, you worship. Um, and my life just completely changed. I was, you know, wasn't getting in trouble anymore. I wasn't going out drinking and stuff, you know, weekend a little bit, but um, yeah, and I had this new community. And um, so that was pretty much it. I just lived and basically slept martial arts. And um, I got my black belt. Um, and in 1995, I opened my first school in London. And then shortly after that, um, it was a very underground back in the UK, but it was the UFC was kind of bubbling under and people were talking about this new hybrid kind of martial arts. And we, my style, we were, we were very proud of the fact that we believed ours was a very street savvy. You, it, you could put it into any situation, it would work. And then, you know, you see the usual story, you see the Gracie come out and then just take these guys down and we're like, holy shit. And then, so the Gracies came over to London, I think it was 96, and they invited black belts from different styles for a big seminar. And there was no uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in London back then, and they were looking to. Well, I, I remember I, I had some some fights myself in, in UK, like yeah. mostly about, about, about one. And so the thing is, like, uh, they didn't have much uh, BJ guys, no. not even grappling guys. No. Their striking was awesome. Yeah. Like, very proficient, very, you know, high level intelligence striking. Yeah. But was very rare to see, uh, you when, know. When was that? How long ago was that? Oh, uh, early two thousand, late nineties. Uh, so should be somewhere about like uh, uh, two thousand and between two thousand five, two thousand eight, yeah. nine, something like that. It's probably when it really started. I've been to, two to times there, I think. Yeah. I mean, there was there was jujitsu then, but it was still no, no, there was. Yeah. But there but, was not that good, you know. No. Like you, you, you can you you rather like go on the ground with these guys. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was still very new. So, like when the Gracie come over, they they did this seminar, and we were like, holy shit, this is amazing. We need to incorporate this, and they were looking. They were setting up at the time. Um, their first European Academy in Switzerland and they were looking for black belts already from other styles to transition and become jiu-jitsu guys and you go over and spend three months get your purple belt and you know so on so on well you know we were you know let's let's learn this and integrate into our style you know and, and the, the term MMA was never wasn't even out then you know and then I, I remember freestyle fighting yeah free fighting yeah uh, yeah. In in Russia there was this mixed fight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Freestyle, open mat, you know, competitions and stuff. So I was competing, I'd I'd do an amateur fight for every sort of six months just to as we were learning all this stuff, I wanted to try it out. Yeah. And then um we just kept training and training and we almost left our stand up to the side because we were just it was having this new tool to play with. Yeah. And it was everything was new, everything was fresh. <laughs> oh my god. And uh, I remember for months, I wouldn't even hit pads or anything. I just wanted to wrestle and roll all the time. And my training partner, Lee, who was my original instructor, um, we used to go and hire squash courts out and put mats down and we'd spar in a squash court. And uh, we just like put the, our, our harbingers on, which was the original, like the pride gloves we had. And we just like beat the shit out of each other. And well, these pride and... gloves, I remember I, I had, I had... Uh, uh, some of my friends was was coming in Japan. They brought this. They was actually super comfortable. Yeah. They uh, the the pride goals was better for strikers. Yeah. Because I remember they had this little tip that, that yeah. uh, covers your your, your yeah. knuckle. Yeah. Uh, not the knuckle. The yeah. The the first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. The first yeah, joint. Yeah. And uh, the thing is like when I when I start fighting from kickboxing, start fighting combat some more. Yeah. The first thing is like my hands get. Bashed yeah. because uh, you know I was used you know to to be with the big wolf and my hands yeah. is, hand is loose. Yeah, and also you 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 don't worry so much about angles of your punches when yeah. you have a big pillow on your hand. Yeah, and you you know go go in an awkward angle. Yeah. But if you do that with the small goals, you smash your fingers yeah. and it hurts. Yeah, not when you fight, but when you pull the goals and like ah. Oh. Yeah, 
and you're like, I remember like after my first summer of fight, like, combat summer fight, where he's like, oh, and yeah. I go, what I did. It just is so smashing. But I remember like uh, someone brought this to me and I was using it because. The half inches. Yeah. yeah. Back in the days, like you, you, you fight with the ghost you have. You yeah. <laughs> no one yeah, could fight. Exactly, yeah. And uh, they, they had this little bit that was covering this, uh, the, the, the first joint. Yeah. It was so comfortable, I love them. Yeah, yeah. They, were they even had this, uh, they was with, uh, with laces. Oh no, these ones. No, was, I know which was not dead, but it was there was like yeah, with laces, those, like yeah. like old old school like yeah. boxing gloves. That were the old Bruce Lee ones. These <laughs> with those. But no, these were. These I, were I know the Bruce. I, that was my actually no first competition on on uh, was on kind of later, which is kind of like MMA wise. Yeah. We fight with these Bruce Lee ones. Yeah. They like they like up to here. Yeah. You know, up to the mid of the for the yeah, forearm and like shoelace uh, with yeah. like laces and uh, they're very awkward gloves. They have fingers yeah. like this. The you know, pallet fingers, yeah, they're very, very yeah, funny. Goes. I mean, there was, there was, there was no industry back then. There was, everyone had sprawl shorts. They had the original sprawl shorts. Oh yeah, the sprawl shorts. Yeah, yeah there was legendary. Yeah. And you, and you cut them, you cut them up up to the hip, you yeah. know. So yeah. I, and I remember when they they were evolving and they had the plastic like groin. So you get traction, and then they brought the plastic down here. So when you work in guard, you'd stick to people. It's all these different things, but yeah, I mean that was the. It was the days where everything was a trial, you know. Let's try this. Doesn't work. Let's get rid of it. Let's do this. This works. Let's keep it. And that's and we were, as far as I know, and to this day, we were the first fully integrated mixed martial arts academy, um, martial arts system, which is, which is still to this day called Pro Mind UK. Um, so yeah, so um, for amateur, and then um, I had no, I never wanted to be a fighter, but I just loved testing myself. Um, and then uh, in 1999, I um, had a few things happen and I just wanted to get away from the UK for a while. Um, I sold my gym and then um, we went to, I went backpacking and I went traveling for, ended up being almost two and a half years. And I trained a bit here and be there, but it was more of a kind of a get away from me because I wanted to reset button. And then, um, and then Australia was part of my traveling. So I absolutely loved it over here. Went back to UK, trained for a little bit longer. I trained for my third dan in my style, my pro my style then, and um, got my third dan, and then took my first pro fight, which ended up being my only pro fight because I injured my back. But um, I used to compete at 93, and then um, I, was, I wanted to get one more fight before I left the UK to come to Australia, and I was desperate. And then I was supposed to fight in the June or July, and it was old my combat, which nowadays is is the cage rage which changed uh, um not cage rage um what's the big uk one? Oh my god it is cage rage anyway it was the, it was the only real um promotion back then like the, a lot of the guys back in the like john cavanaugh come through the combat and all this so um yeah so i was supposed to fight this guy uh, i'm with spencer 93 great and then he dropped out and then um I was literally, I was, it was September and I was moving to Australia in December and I was like, ah, oh. and anyway, they called me up and said, look, we've got a fight for you, but it's heavyweight. I'm like, I don't care. I just, I just put me in. Um, and it turned out to be James Thompson, who was, um, I didn't even look him up at the time, but he was on a crazy run in the UK back then. And um, I remember he found, <laughs> he found weight um, twice and then, and then miraculously he, he made way out of the back at some point and uh <laughs> I, I was i was um i was 96 or 97 kilos a week out and i was supposed to be fighting heavyweight and i was, I was just eating and trying to think oh, if i just get heavy you know there was no nutrition back then you yeah. know i was just, well, I, was, I, I, had, I, was I had the heavy. same like uh, i you know like uh, as opposed to fight with someone who is heavier yeah and i was trying to eat yeah it's crazy. Why? Yeah. <laughs> no, when I work, it's just, just, it's just so that yeah, that doesn't <laughs> make any sense, yeah. you know, just to, to try to stack calming, yourself with food and you calming, think that you're going to be bigger or stronger. Yeah. I don't know what was in my mind. I just, just, I just had this thing. I had to be over 100 kilos. <laughs> I had to be over 100 kilos. I'm fighting heavyweight. Anyway, so I weighed in. I was 101. I was like really happy. And then I remember they called Thompson up and we were weighing in and he's just this colossus. I mean, that was his name, Colossus. He come in and like he failed weight at 120. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. And I remember my friend um, Lee, who was my coach, he was on the card as well, and he brought his sister along, and uh, she was quite loud. And then Thompson stand there in his underpants, like fouled weight, and I always remember her going, "Oh my God, is that the guy you're fucking fighting?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> 
and everyone kind of looked around at me. I'm like, oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yeah, so um, myself and Lee, we we went and we were supposed to corner each other. All the, all the that's st- the worst. Oh, stupid things. As a coach now, these are all the things you learn going yeah. through all these processes. But Lee was like fight three, and I was like fight five. And uh, Lee had a war, and he went three rounds, and he come out, his ribs were busted, his nose broken. It was an amazing fight, but he was so busted up he couldn't corner me. And I'd had this massive adrenaline rush cornering him. That's why I say it's oh. the worst because I did similar thing. Uh, we had a uh, with the guy who is coaching back back home now. Uh, he's my student Vari. Like uh, we got uh, we got in the same fight night, and that was main event. And he was fighting before. Yeah. As coaching him it was absolute disaster. Yeah. Because uh, uh, he, he he did a good fight. He was always doing a good fights, but he lost, and I was pissed off, and I it totally ruined everything that I supposed There's to. There's no focus. You're just yeah, yeah, completely like, dry. All your all yeah. your mental energy went for for Go. this one. Yeah. And then you're going, and when you have to fight, you're like, it's all you're already empty. All your ideas, yeah. all your concentration is out. You're draining. You just like going on on auto part and you do stuff that you when you are watching the fight like why why oh, yeah. I'm doing that <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't need you know yeah, to I know I remember going out the yeah. back after Lee's and I was completely drained I was like jeez oh, and then like, he said to me he said I can't corner you I said I'm just, he was busted up I was like no no it's fine anyway his dad was there and his brother and they 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 didn't really know the MMA game back then they were from traditional style I was like oh, don't they they'd be there anyway so. I got it back, and then the one of the fights. So there was two fights between us. One of them got canned, and so there was one fight, and it finished within like a minute. So I literally got out the back. I remember hitting pads like two or three times, and I didn't even wrap my hands. I just put my four ounce gloves on, and they dragged me out, and I was out. And then um, I was facing bloody James Thompson, and yeah, it just it was it was awful. He literally just chucked me across the, the cage, and um, he choked me unconscious in like. I just started three minutes bulldog joke and uh oh, the, the boy yeah, yeah so but anyway that was that was my pro debut in london and when i moved to australia um i was saving up to open my gym because i'd sold my gym in the uk um and open up an mma gym in sydney and then i was working a building site and i blew and hemorrhage and blew three discs out my back so that was that was the end of my fight career or not How did that like for by by like hmm? work injury? Yeah, it was on the building site. So I was oh. carrying slabs of marble up a, a ladder. We we're building a house um, in Sydney, and there was no one to take the slabs off my shoulder at the top of the ladder because um, there was no stairs in the house at the time. It was building it from fresh. So I got the top, and then I tried to to bend and put these marble slabs down that I didn't want to break and chip. And as I, I rolled my back, and as I pushed the, my lumbar spine all the discs popped and hemorrhaged wow. so i was out for two years um and for the first six months i couldn't i couldn't walk 10 paces i was so much pain and um and i was seeing surgeons and they were like back then this is 2005 uh, there's no surgery we can fuse it all together so I rod in my back and take all the three discs out or you can wait and i remember the, this surgeon saying 10 years time there's probably be you know Technology. You could, yeah, the technology would be there. And I was I mean, thinking, how the fuck can I survive 10 years with this? And I was depressed. You know, I was seeing a counsellor. It, it was horrendous. And I was saying, you're never going to train again. And that was my life. Um, so anyway, long, very long story short, uh, I rehabbed myself pretty much, got back in the swimming pool, trained, trained. And my my progression was measured by how far I could walk. That's literally it. I could, I could walk five minutes. The next week, I'd try and walk six minutes without my back going into spasm. Oh. Um, anyway, long, like I say, long story short, two years later, I got back, got back into a gym and I retrained as a personal trainer, I got my qualification um, and I wanted to train people to, um, with injury prevention, you know, all the things I've learned, um, being a martial artist and then my back injury, I thought I'd be able to help people doing that. And then um, some of the guys that I was working with, I was managing the gym, found out I used to do MMA and I fought and stuff, they were all like, Oh, can you show us stuff at lunchtime and all this? So um, I used to go in, and I was so scared to injure my back. And uh, I, I just kind of stand over him. Okay, put your knee here, your knee there. Like, That's side control. And then, and and in the end, it was like, okay, I'll just get down and show you. And and literally over six months, I just do something, c- c- 
can I do this? Yeah, I can do that. I can, can I, and I just started adding and I would never do any. So if I was teaching takedowns, I'd never lift anyone. I'd never elevate anyone. I'd drive or pivot. Um, but it, I got packs and then within a few months, every Saturday I had like 10 or 15 guys and we had a fight camp and, and we used to just train and uh, so, yeah, yeah. so cool. Yeah, it, it, it is weird when you had like nasty injury and uh, when you actually recovering and it's actually, it's way after you actually recovered, your brain actually lets you to try. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's holding your, your mind is holding you, holding you back yeah. more, more than you, you actually, you know, you, yeah. you so scared. More I was than so scared. Period. Yeah. Two years of just literally just in a, I used to wake up in pain and I, it's almost like, and it's here and it's true. You'd have a dark cloud over you constantly. I was depressed. And um, when that went, I was so petrified of my wife. She would, she'd said to me, you don't ever risk your back again. And so I wouldn't tell her I was training guys doing MMA. So I'd come home from the gym and I'd have a bruise on my arm or something like that. And she'd go, where's that from? I go, oh, I got bumped and all this. And I remember one day I'd always worked Saturdays because I had my fight guys come in. And we, anyway, she turned up at my gym and she walked through and into the room while I was training these guys and she went crazy. And I was like, oh shit. So anyway. Look, next stage was um, a couple of guys that I trained that were quite wealthy. Um, I used to talk to them when I was training them and, uh, and I used to talk about opening up my MMA gym and, you know, the vision I had for the sport in Australia, you know, and I wanted to get more people into the sport and get the usual sort of blue collar work done, but get, you know, people that um, you wouldn't normally think would do mixed martial arts, you know, people that are white collar workers. So I opened up, they come on and invested in with me and I opened up my first gym in Sydney called Platinum Extreme um, and that was a it was a beautiful gym it was um, you could see I had an office you could see the Sydney Harbour Bridge we had two big rooms um, um, all zebra mats caged fence like um, padded walls all down the side and this is this is 2009 and there wasn't there wasn't really anything around Sydney back then and we had a big strength conditioning room um, and then we had a boxing room it was a beautiful gym, um, and that's that's where I created Winter Warrior. So, um, and that was off the back of I had this amazing facility, and I thought people are going to see this. I'm going to show pictures of it in adverts, and people are going to be queuing up to become members. But because it was an MMA gym, no one was coming through the doors. You know, it's a struggle, and you know we're losing money. And I was like, how can I get people to come in and and do mixed martial arts? Um, because I had I had a jiu jitsu coach there, I had a Muay Thai coach. And that would do all right, but MMA has always been my passion. I run all the MMA classes. It used to drive me crazy. So one day my back was in spasm. I went to um, to see a guy to get some acupuncture. And I was having my acupuncture, and I remember hobbling back to the train station to get back to the gym. And I literally had this this idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to train someone for free. Um, and the name came to me straight away. I'm going to call it. I'm going to get a whip and I'm going to turn him into war and I'm going to document it. And, I'm, and the idea was I'd, I'd find someone you'd never think would do mixed martial arts. Someone that's really unconditioned, though, kind of someone that's very timid, works as an accountant or something. And then I'd take pictures and video and I'd train him for six months free, but he had to agree to have an amateur fight at the end. Um, and I'd make a video series and blog it and put it on YouTube and go, this guy can do it. What's your excuse? So that was the plan. So um, put a post on Facebook um, and I had 400 people email me in one week saying, I want to do it. So I was like, holy shit, this, this, this is something. something. This is yeah. something. So then my mind was going, okay, let's, let's get a TV company involved and let's film it. Let's make a TV show, you know? Like the On The Fight was doing it, but this was like, this is new. So I was like, okay, yeah. So, so anyway, so... Um, I borrowed some money and um, I got a production company involved and we filmed it as a YouTube series, but a proper series, you know, it cost a fair bit of money. And um, I held tryouts and I invited 50 people down from applications. Um, and then out of that 50, I took 25, I think it was. And then literally, I, I mean, I, know how, I knew how to train people, but I didn't know how to train a group of people at the same time to fight in six months. I was like, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? I need strength conditioning. I need this, I need that. So it was a real work in progress. And, but over that space, I created this program and it's the, pretty much the program that runs all around the world now. Um, but 
the thing is, I am. Um, it, people always laugh because my favourite TV shows, I, I, could, I like watching fights and stuff, but I love watching like Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent, stuff like this, talent shows, because I love people doing what they're passionate about. And I get a big thrill of some kid come out on stage that, you know, really quite embarrassed and stuff. And then he opens up and he's got this amazing voice. And I think he's following his passion. He's doing, this is amazing. So that was always something I love. And, and, and to this day, I still love watching all those programs. But my my um, Britain's Got Talent moment was finale because I'd done this thing. I've been training these people, but I didn't know if they, when they get in the cage, if they'd perform because everyone was going, this is bullshit. Like so many people, there were a lot of fighters that actually messaged me on Twitter and stuff going, this is actually bad for the sport, especially fighters. This is It's disrespectful. People shouldn't be fighting after 22 weeks. And I was like, listen, this is amateur sport. We're trying to build the sport. We need more people in. They're not pro fighters. This is amateur. Anyway, so. But 20, 20, 22 weeks. Two weeks, that's what, five months? Yeah, five months, yeah. So from tryouts, so we had tryouts, and then there was a couple of weeks off, and then they started, and there's a week break in between. So, but it's over. It's like 110 sessions, the training sessions. It's five that, days that, a week. That, 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 that's a fair bit for. for, for for starting competing yeah i think so starting yeah. like i personally you know like uh, uh i have a like a uh, requirement you know for my students to train six months my, my yeah. time before they they even try yeah because it doesn't make sense you need to have some certain knowledge yeah for before sure. actually getting the match so, but i think like five six months is 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 it's it depends on their commitment obviously but these guys are... I mean mat time, you know. Yeah. Obviously if you if you if you if you sign up for six months, yeah, you might pay membership, but if you're not turning it, you're not actually training. These guys are like every single morning. It was five thirty in the morning till seven AM, Monday to Friday. It was condensed. And the thing is, because the, my concern was how am I gonna get so many people ready at the same time? But it actually makes it easier because everyone lifts each other, you know the saying, you know, a high tide lifts all ships. It's the same on the mats. It, when you've got everyone that's got the same goal at the end, someone's tired one day or someone's grumpy or someone, everyone like there'd be someone to bring you up and they're all going to the same end, this this same um, point of, of um, finishing their journey. So it was actually easier as a coach to teach a bigger group than it would be one person to keep that person motivated. And, you know, and he's in a class and there's people at different levels and, but everyone's the same at this and it was amazing. So. Yeah, so going back to the talent show thing, I remember being at the finale and thinking, oh shit, I was so nervous. And there was some press there, local press wanted to cover it, first time it's ever been done. And I'm thinking, oh my God, the first fight, they come out and they just freeze. I'm going to be a frigging laughing stock. And it's, that's it, it's fight finished. And I was like, oh my God. So when I picked the card, I picked like, I thought the fights had the best chance of being exciting right at the beginning. And I thought that would build momentum and everyone would kind of jump in. Just, just to ask, uh, mm. uh, when they understand in 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 Winter Warrior, yeah, that who who of of their their training they they're up. gonna fight, yeah, yeah. They I normally up. it's about three weeks out. Normally, I do it. Okay. Um, I think I did it earlier back then, but now it's sort of two three weeks out because it changes the whole atmosphere. Of the yeah, group. that's why I'm asking yeah, because like, once I'm you know that, him, once you know you go, you're gonna you're gonna fight with yeah. these guys, like. Yeah. Because you just say how, how they're actually helping each other while yeah, they're, they're, they're preparing friends. just to... They're all friends. But in, in the moment that you know, yeah. I'm going to fight these guys, like... Yeah, they have to switch off. They, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. different. It does change. And then you have to do separate training sessions. For instance, if you're doing sparring and stuff, you know, you have group one, blue team and red team, we call them. Okay. Um, but yeah, it changes the, the, the dynamic massively. So, but, but, so I'm there and I'm thinking, oh my God, the first guys that come out, um and it was a amazing fight it's a, it's, a crowd went crazy like the atmosphere in in uh, winter war at their finales is so different from any other fight night because there's not one person in the crowd that doesn't have a friend or brother or sister or mum or dad that's fighting so everyone is is like really electric. involved yeah and if your brother's in blue team you're gonna cheer on every other blue team fight. Yeah. It's like a soccer match. It's like, yeah, you yeah, become tribal. It's, it's, and I remember one finale I had at Luna Park, and we sold the tickets, blue team, red team, and we tried to divide the whole stadium up. It was two thousand people almost. <laughs> wow. But it was so hard to do. Like it, we did it, but it, and the atmosphere was great. Like the the MC would always go, "Hey, it's the blue team," and they went, "Wow." Oh, but um, it was just too hard work. But 
yeah, the first fight and then the second fight and the third fight and then people were actually saying to me, and I remember the refs at the time were going, how long have they really been training? I was like, 22 weeks. And they're like, yeah, but how long have they actually been training before in Toronto? I'm like, no, these are all, I think one guy had a bit of jiu-jitsu, um, but everyone was start afresh. Some of the guys haven't even seen them MMA fight before. It was crazy. And then from there, it just, it just kind of picked up so much momentum. Um, second finale was um, we had it, and it was in this gym. I talked to guys in this gym. Um, Just yeah, here, yeah, this, this? this particular gym, oh. yeah, because um, I left my gym and I was starting a new one, and I didn't want to wait, so I, I ran a series, and I took this in the morning because there was no one here, um, and then um, that was at Luna Park, and that was um, I think I sold out eighteen hundred tickets. It was the biggest amateur show in Australian history, and then the next one I opened my new gym in Brookvale. Um, and I had 60 people in the series, um, and I had a thousand people register for that series. It was it was insane, because the Fox TVs we filmed the second one for Fox TV, and I'm on Fox Sports One. Is it is it on Fox now? It, you can still watch it. So it's on iTunes. The whole series that was filmed for Fox. So if you put in Winter on iTunes, the whole series is on there. Um, so that was the second series, and then um, and then it kind of it went from there. So I. My coach in London, I, I was talking to him about it all the time, and because it's the the thing about it, it's it benefits everyone because um, coaches in the gyms. I mean, it's there's nothing more rewarding than taking a group of people for their first fight, but they're normally not earning money at five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. So coaches are getting monetized. The gym is bringing new people into the gym that would never normally walk through the door, um, and then you've got is you've got um, all the other things that go along with it, you know, people that are suddenly in the sport, now they're watching the UFC, they're paying pay-per-views, they're buying magazines, they're joining their local gym when Winter Warrior finishes. So it, it just builds the whole industry. Um, but yeah, it's, and then, so London started and then we had a series in Melbourne and Brisbane and then um, I had a conversation with John Cavanaugh because I had a guy from Ireland over and he went home to Cork um, and trained at SBG Cork and told those guys and they wanted to do the program. Um, but they said, you know, we, we're part of SBG and we can't do it without John Kavanaugh giving the OK. So I had a Skype with John Kavanaugh and I remember I was really nervous at the time. <laughs> John Kavanaugh, I'm going to be talking to John Kavanaugh. Yeah. And, and now we're really good mates. But at the time, it was a really big thing for me. And he loved the idea and he was like, I'm going to do the first one. I was like, OK. So John came on, we did Dublin and that was massive. Um, and now we're in eight countries with 50 gyms, you know, wow. around the world. So it's um, it's been quite a ride, um, but I, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's every year two or three thousand new people start in MMA that would never normally do it without Winter Warrior, the majority of the time, um, which which I'm really proud of. And then from there, um, I got introduced and through John with um, um, Kerrick Brown from, from IMAP, we were over in Vegas. And um, he said, you know, that um, he told Kerrick that I was doing big things in Australia and around the world. And Kerrick asked me to get involved with IMAF. Um, we had dinner in Vegas and I was, of course, very excited about that. And, um, and I went to Bahrain last November for the first time, saw the setup, um, realized the amount of work that needed to be done in Australia. Uh, my wife still thinks I'm actually completely crazy taking it on, but um, yeah, but it's a it's a passion play for me. You know, Winter Warrior is doing great. Um, I don't coach as much as I used to with Winter Warrior because I travel so much. But IMAF is IMAF is is so pure because it's 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 for free. We all do it for nothing. No one gets paid, and I love that. And um, I love the idea. For me, um, if I can in 10 years time, retire or whatever, and say I I was part of the reason or I helped MMA get into the Olympics, that would be my legacy. I, I don't care if I'm, if there's a list of 100 people that helped, if I'm 99, or I don't care, I wanna be on that list. And I think that, I, I, I think that I can bring a lot to the table and, and help that happen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, Wimp to Warrior story and my introduction to Ahmed. Uh Speaking about Wimp to Warrior and I coming out, uh, out from, uh, we saw a couple of girls turning out, which was awesome mm. uh, today on the scouting session. And 
I'm all about like female MMA. Uh, b- back home, I had like my wife was the first MMA girl in, yeah, in, right. in Bulgaria. So because of that, we had like pretty solid uh, girl team, but they didn't have to, to whom to compete with. So sometimes, yeah. you know, on grappling they have to compete with each other just. And they was like, yeah, but we we just asked, you know, we have to go to other girls to see that you're there and come. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, was pushing this hard, and now like uh, now there are a lot of girls that practice practicing home. But um, the thing is, uh, it's it's so nice to see the girls turn in. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious, like, uh, what's the percentage of uh, of hmm. females who got involved in the War- Women to Warrior program? It it depends where. So the very first series when I come up with the concept, I was actually um, I was at, I was actually against women's MMA then. To be honest, um, this is 2011. 2012 I started Winter Warrior and I was like oh I, I didn't like it I didn't think it was good for the sport I thought um, I thought it was it was too much ammunition for people that hated what we did anyway by putting females in there it's like we're just giving them ammunition so mm. when I did it when I did the first Winter Warrior I, I said it's men only and okay. I had all these women messaging me going you know that's wrong you should be allowing women in the sport blah 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 and I was like oh and then my, my female strength conditioning coach Rachel who's did the, the course she was the strength coach on it she's like you should open up because I've been training her for years in MMA I was like oh no I just I, I don't want all the haters you know putting women in a cage uh, anyway I buckled in the end and I'm so glad I did because back then there was no women in the UFC um, like Ronda Rousey was no no one even heard of her back then yeah. so um, but the women's fights every single series I've had fight of the night is always the females they just go so hard. There's, they've got, I think there's no ego, but they've also got more to prove because they like, guys know how to fight. We have to really prove that we can fight. And they just go, they just go so hard. And since then, so in Sydney, for instance, um, the, the last couple of series that I personally ran, it was around 40%. I did one series 50-50. That was the best one ever. But normally around Sydney, it's, it's 35 to 40% females. In, but then in Dublin, where it's a very male sport, um, we'd have a series of 50 people on the mats and we might get three, three, four females. But then recently, um, there was a TV so- series on uh, RTE, which is their main channel in Ireland. And it's a series called The Wingman. And basically what it is, 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 a, is an Irish comedian, very well known in Ireland, um, who basically they create this TV show where they find people that want to challenge themselves for some reason. Um, and he's the wingman, so he has to do exactly what they do. So there was a there was a, a amazing lady. I think she, she I think she was around fifty, um, but she was a um, a victim of uh, domestic violence, um, and she also beat cancer. And uh, she was a yoga instructor, and she wanted she wanted to do some. She wrote to the TV show and said, "I, I want to do something to improve my my confidence because of the domestic violence, you know." and, and do something that I wouldn't normally do. So they come up with the idea, oh, you need to learn MMA. Let's do MMA. So they went to John Kavanaugh. I said, she needs to do with to Warrior. So anyway, so they did a condensed version over three months. And then she fought someone from Winter Warrior. And they, she trained every day and she wore all our stuff. Um, and then that came out just before we opened registrations for the next series. Um, and now it's 50-50 in Dublin, 50%. Wow, that's pretty good. So going from 5 6%. And now it's a 50-50. So it's all about perception. You know, I think it's um, it's like Canada, um, we get a lot of female participation. US is growing, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I, I love the fact, I love seeing all these females coming in. And, you know, we've had grandmas doing this program, like literally grandma, grandparents. Um, I'll tell you one very quick story. Um, it's one of my favorite stories. So there's some been amazing people that have done the program, and I love the age thing because it's MMA is is now it, the perception that it's all guys with shaved heads and tattoos has gone, but there's still a perception where it's only really for young people. Of course, if you're going to be a profile, you need to start early. You can't be in your fifties, forties, but it doesn't mean that people in their forties and fifties can't do our sport. Um, we had one. There was a one fight in Manchester, went to where this year and the two guys had a combined age of 107 <laughs> 107 combined age wow. but and we had a grandma do it there we've had 
57 year old in Belfast and 50 year olds here, but this one story in, in Cork in Ireland, um, a, a girl did the series and she was, she was young, she was like 18 or something, did the series, I think on their first or second series, loved it, tried to get her mum to do the second series, she refused. So her grandma said, I'll do it. So her grandma signed up for the next series. She does a series, she was like 55 or something. Um, and then there's this picture of her at the finale and her granddaughter is in the corner. Oh, and um, her no grandma way. is standing there, elevated Whoa. in the case. And there's a picture of her grandma like this and her granddaughter just looking up going, I was like, that to me. Wow. If there's <laughs> That's one a picture, story. a story that dismisses every thought or process around our sport in terms of demographic that's it for me and she went on and she fought i think two or three times in the amateur circuit really in in ireland and what she a won, legend she won i think i think she won all of them or she might have lost one but she was in all the papers but that to me that's what a legend. that's the thing i'm most proud about winter war is that they would never have that opportunity and then you'd never hear that without the, this program so wow. that's that's my favorite story Oh, that's amazing. That, that's a good, a good one. It's that's so a good, good one. one. That's it. That's one of the things that, uh, you know, like, it just happened in this circle of martial arts. Just like, people can actually do that stuff. It's yeah. just like, it's crazy. Mm. Uh, it's uh, like recently was the fight with, uh, you know, Bogoy, uh, who fought with Taito Tuivasa. Yes. Uh, he was my teammate in the national team. Yeah, right. And he has this crazy story. He got stabbed in the heart. But bad, you know, he was stabbed, uh, under stabbed, under rip, straight in the heart. He was dead for seven days. Like he was in, in coma. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, because all of the team, like, we, because it was the first national team in Kokomo Town, we, we, we still kind of like, uh, uh, like yeah. keep, keep close to each other. We don't communicate so much yeah, because that was 10 years ago, but yeah. we kind of feel close. So everyone was like, what's going on with the war going, you know, like uh, staying in the hospital, you know, trying to keep in touch. And the doctor, the doctor was kind of, you know, he has, because he, he was heavyweight athlete, mm. right? They say he has so much muscle mass and his heart w w probably won't make it. Yeah. Because all the, they say that if he was white, white and stop in the heart, it's, while the heart, heart is alive, he can like still kind of like pump and feed the muscles, but because he's so big yeah, so and he's not like hot. just a big, uh, yeah. like, uh, as a, you know, depends on the body mass because they were saying like, it was just like fat and stuff mm. and, and a bit of muscle. It, it, yeah, it, it doesn't get blood anymore. Yeah. Fat anyway. But the thing, yeah. it, all this muscle, they need blood. Yeah. And there was, there was kind of politely explaining us to, ex to expect the worst for him. Like, yeah. And he was, he was dead, you know. So he was like, uh, he was walking like, uh, like 95, 6 uh, kilos. Mm. He dropped to like, uh, like 80 for a week. Just by being dead, <laughs> and uh, okay, he waked up. Uh, you know, like he was like was walking dead. You know, like uh, they was in, doing uh, making interview with him. Like he couldn't open his mouth. He was speaking from yeah. You know, this opening in, in the throat. It was like I was like dead, and and he wake up and he say, "I'm gonna fight." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you you're gonna make it." But and he say, "No, no, I'm, I'm gonna fight." And you see, and he was saying like. He was like in this voice, and you cannot refuse a guy who is in this condition. Yeah, 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 mate, you're gonna make it. Just you know, as, as long as he's yeah, alive. Yeah. Then he started training. He was like, oh, that's maybe not. Yeah. Oh, wow, you know, like he yeah. runs two years after the case, and like probably not the best idea, you know, to get back in competitive mm. fighting uh, once you're being stabbed in the heart. Yeah, and literally, you know, the the the, the they was uh, they, the doctor was saying because like he's uh, he's pretty annoying Bulgaria. Like, was all about the TV. The the the, the blade actually like pierced the heart. Yeah. And then, and then uh, like uh, we start seeing you know like these uh, videos you know, posting doing pets like. No, mate, please. And then uh, after a while he book his fight you know like pro fight uh, you know and we were like. You know, yeah, <laughs> he won't. Okay, like happy. Yeah, that's how I can finish there. You know, you kind of, you know, like. Eh. And then he, uh, like, then he start fighting regularly. I was like, okay, you know, like. Yeah. And uh, even before that, he was, he's, he's a beast of mine. You know, yeah. you know, you cannot beat this guy because he just refused to give up. Yeah. And he's uh, physically strong as the most. I saw him two times uh, tearing a sambugi. 
on the competition just making you rip and like just by resting it gears and it's a uh, it's a one piece some gigs like jujitsu gig like it's it's yeah. interlocking it's it's yeah. it's made to be pulled yeah. you make pull ups on this thing and he tears it by you know with your most is a strong guy right and yeah. and he signed with Bellator you know after this story where he made a couple of fights uh he won this uh, eight man heavyweight tournament uh and now he's in UFC and like crazy man like yeah. being in this sport sports the the main thing you actually see people like doing stuff that yeah they're unreal they're unreal yeah. like but well, i always talk about the 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 thing that competition and martial arts gives people is and it sounds corny because of the name of my business winter but it's that warrior spirit it's if you can do this you can do anything and i always say to people the best thing about martial arts it teaches you how to lose and losing is actually good because you can't get good at anything in martial arts without losing you know, you learn a new technique, you suck at it. You get beaten up trying to do that technique, you get better at it, and then you learn a new technique. And then, and then a training partner comes along, he's better than you, and he beats you, and you just lose, and then eventually you start catching up with him, and then someone else comes along. And unless you're constantly losing in martial arts, you're never going to grow, you're never going to get better. You, you're never going to be great if you're the guy that can beat everyone on the mat every day, because you're never going to get challenged, and you won't get mentally stronger. And it's that mentality when that people can take away from this when shit gets real in their life or whatever and challenges come is it's okay what's the worst thing can happen is i lose okay let's do it whereas some people are so scared about failing in life they shy away from everything and then if they do they get forced into something they're like deer in a headlight and they just can't perform because they're so scared of the outcome whereas martial arts teach you that the outcome is not bad losing john cavanaugh his book Win or learn. You either win or you learn. Yeah. There's no loss. You don't. You, there is no loss. You try your best. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, you have limited control on the outcome of a competition. You can control your your preparation. Uh, your mm. your your you keep your regime. You you know to 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 keep your trainings and everything. Yeah. But on the day of the fight. Yeah. It's it, it, it everything can happen. Yeah. Everything yeah. can happen. Yeah. It. And it's all right. Yeah. As long as uh, as you're doing your best, it, it's all right. Yeah. It's all right. Like and and uh, I I think I think that's one of the uh, one of the beauty of the amateur sport, but that you actually are allowed to do your mistakes. Yeah. Of learning. Yeah. Well, I think my personal perception for professional athlete is you kind of not allowed to have mistakes. Hmm. I mean, not not in the same same degree. Well, as a, a, amateur. It's all right. Well, it, it, you're pro, learning. Yeah, you're amateur. Professional, it affects everything in your life. You know, it's your pay. Yeah. You know, most pros, you know, it's, it, it's, if you lose, you get half your money. A yeah. lot of these promotions is, it's you know, and but it's, it's still the same. It's still the same. Like it, it's still right to lose. Yeah. It's 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 not a big deal, and uh, you have to deal with that. If you if you if you're a fighter and you're a professional fighter, sooner or later it might happen. For sure. And uh, it's it's it yeah. it's still right, but the thing is. All the whites, you know, all the exposure of the fights gives gives a bit of pressure on you. Yeah. While as an amateur, you, you go on a tournament, you yeah. perform, okay, and uh, then call your mom and yeah, I competed today, I did that, uh, and uh, I have this uh, have this principle because I had my dad watch me fight only once, and I was because I was thinking of him, yeah, uh, what he's gonna think. And then uh, I I thought to my parents, you never come when I fight. Yeah. I always call you mm. after. And and I had this like when I finished fight, the first thing calling my my mom and dad say I, I fought today, I did that, I did that, and like uh, okay I I won, I was, but always after. Yeah. Because if if they know that I'm going to fight, first of all, they they suffer too much. Sure. You know they they think you know like they building up, they, like 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 they 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 are going to fight, right? Yeah. And it gives too much pressure on me, right? I, like yeah, uh, sure. I I'm not living with them since I'm 18, but you know like if they know that I'm about to fight. Which was a bit of a problem when they started finding pro because they started announcing the fights, yeah. and then they know that I'm fine. They go, "Oh, uh, how I'm good." No, like, and uh, like, my my mom not so much because uh, my my mom is actually from Russia, and uh, my uh, one of her brothers was uh, was fighting. My granddad was actually fighting. That's how he was uh, uh, he was making his uh, his money to feed the family. He's, he's he was just a, 
great chart. I never saw him mm. because he died by by liver from drinking. Yeah, right. Because the guy was uh, uh, after the war. Well, there was no like uh, how how they call it PSD at that time. Yeah, no, like no whatever. Yeah. Uh, so after the war, you know, like uh, he survived the war. He was fine, but. Then you know, like uh, he was not really interested in, in into getting in jobs and stuff. Mm. So he was drinking what? And uh, in in the area that I'm um, I'm born in Siberia, uh, they have this tradition which is called like wall fighting. Uh, and it's a it's a crazy thing, you know. Like uh, they go in the in uh, so two two villages are doing that. So they're going in one of the the pubs who are like the you know the hosts. Mm. So they clear the tables and everything and. Uh, for example, ten people. It's always you know like a number that they agree. Yeah. Ten people stay on one wall, ten people on the other wall, and uh, the game is you have to touch the wall of of the other guys, and uh, so and they bet you know they they put right. money, and uh, the first one who touches the wall of the of the other guys, uh, you know the team win wins, and they start fighting, <laughs> and uh, and uh, but they they weird rules because uh, it's. You're not able to once you get get dropped, you're out of the game. You're yeah. not able to come back, and you, you don't punch or kick someone who is on the ground. Yeah. But other than that, it's like, <laughs> <Game> <laughs> it's, nice. yeah. yeah. And uh, he was pretty good in that. <laughs> Although very odd, but he was pretty good. And uh, uh, like I never saw him like the story that he was doing a lot of headbutts. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, every, uh, the stories was like that. Uh, Everyone knows he's using head, but he was on landing it, <laughs> and uh, that was what he was doing. You know, drinking, making money this way. He had twelve kids. Wow. That's Viking, <laughs> Viking <Jeez>. life. <laughs> yeah, crazy. So my mom was right. My father was very, you know, very anxious when I'm going to about yeah. to fight because uh, uh, he's a painter. He paints, hmm. and uh, he's way more sensitive in a way. In a yeah, way. An artist. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like. And he hated when I started training. Yeah. He was like, uh, he, it, it was like years of, and I, I kind of like love, love him because was because his opposition of me training was driving me to do it. Yeah. So I was like, I was, yeah. Yeah. But it in the end of it, it end of that it's it's actually a good thing. And uh, it was I remember like I was a champion already like. Uh, I was champion in 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 all in three pros. I was K1 champion a couple of times, uh, Sunda champion, and I, I won uh, uh, the Sunda nationals. And then the, Dad said, uh, "You know what? It's actually good that you kept fighting. <laughs> I've already been fighting for five years." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah." Now now he loves that uh, I'm fighting, yeah. uh, but you know, it's, it took him ages, you know, yeah. to to accept it. But it 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 was cool in a cool way, like yeah. pushing me. The only time my mum comes see me, I got knocked out, head kick, clean. So that, that was it. I never stable. told her. Yeah, stable. Like, yeah. I remember waking up in hospital and I had no memory whatsoever for like it took um, over an hour. They kept asking me the same questions. You know where you are? No, you're in the hospital. What? Yeah, you got head kicked. Huh. Do you know where you are? No. <laughs> you got head kicked. Oh, and my mum's next to me freaking out. Oh my god, it's got brain damage. Uh, oh, yeah, so that was the end. I, I never, I mean, my, my last fight was up. So no one, no one knew. No, 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 no from the family, no friends, you know, yeah. uh, girlfriend. It, it's all right, but you know, the parents are like, it's too, it's, and the thing is, it's too much emotional world for yeah. them, you know. I, I, and even, even, uh, even when uh, someone from my team compete, it's, I'm getting very emotionally very involved. Yeah, and it's draining. Which is absolutely opposite when I fight. Uh, yeah. I get, I was, I was getting swapped very often by my coach because I'm too calm. Right. Because uh, I have this weird mentality. I'm, uh, my anxiety is on the night before I actually have a competition, mm. or then competition just like cold. Yeah. Just and my coach was like, hmm. swapping things. I was like, what? Oh, you're too calm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I was the thing is the thing is I'm uh, actually performing good when a bit angry. Yeah, get fired up a little bit. Yeah. And uh, it's 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 funny. I had this. Uh, uh, I know I know you you're big in, in mental 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 mm. training. And I have this super weird like mental setup. Uh, I imagine that someone uh, killed my brother, right. the guy that I'm going to fight with. Mm. I'm going to revenge for it. 
and you know that pumps me and like uh, and when you know this it sounds super stupid because i don't have brother i have sister <laughs> and uh, it's it's absolutely ridiculous but when you're before a fight you start thinking you start believing in your own yeah, in, in, your in, bullshit, in yeah. bullshit. Yeah. and you know i get on fire you know like i'm going, going to fight and uh, that, that's uh, that's how you know like i i find a way to to get in this uh, like uh, uh yeah this uh a controlled rage because yeah. that's how I perform good. If I'm too calm, I don't perform good. But yeah. the thing is, I, 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 in a way, before uh, you know, before to perform, I kind of my mind walks in this uh, calm state. Mm. But I need a bit of mm. drive, you know, to get in real. So it kind of balances yeah. my Every, mind. Everyone's different. Everyone's different. different. Absolutely, yeah. no. Oh, yeah. I, I have like uh, uh, I have a company. Just, uh, some of them like don't perform good calm. Some don't need to go in the rage yeah. area. Some some of them like. Have to be in between because the rage is overburns if you mm. if you if you're not made for that. So everyone is different. It's yeah. it's very funny, you know how it's very funny. You know the the mental mental part of it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a massive part of the game, massive part. I know I know you're deep in that. Mm. And uh, yeah. how how you when you coach, mm. uh, how how you you approach the, the the mental training? I do a lot of visualization with guys, um, with girls, like people that are, that are doing it. So. Normally, sort of a couple of weeks out, and I get them to we run through because most people throw up from into worry. It's the first time they've fought, so so you, they can't relate to a lot of the the um, experiences that they're going to have. So they can't reenact it in their brain to get. So what I'm trying to do is to I want to invoke um, emotional responses, so their body gets used to that anxious feeling that I need to piss. And your body's ejecting everything out. It's fight or flight. You know, I want them to feel that butterflies and that sick feeling of, holy shit, am I really doing this? So I, I try and get them to visualize things. So I normally get them to do a whole run through. So I get them to get their walkout music sorted out, and then I get them in the gym, walk out, I get them to face off someone, not from the gym, but I grease them up, get in the cage, I go through the whole thing, the announcer, and then I talk about trigger points. So when you do visualization drills, you really want to have these trigger points. So on the time, if you try and visualize something that lasts 15 minutes, it's very hard to stay focused. But you can lose focus, but something triggers your attention, you come back, you come back. So I talk about um, the main trigger points are, is when you're you're out the back and you're warming up and stuff, you're having your hands wrapped, you're feeling calm and you're listening to your music and it's a nice sensation, you've got teammates around you. Um, but the first main trigger point, if you're fight five, for instance, and you know the order, these are your teammates going out, the fight four goes, you know, and you know you're next. That's a massive trigger point. And I talk about, imagine that happening. Imagine the person, your friend, who's in the on the card before you gets, they come out, someone says, you're up next, and then they're off. And then there's no one but you, you're next. And you don't know if it's going to be in one minute or 10 minutes. You have no control over that. And you need to understand that you're going to be very nervous at this point. All the fight and flight's gonna really kick in. You could have been fairly calm until that point. Your corner's talking to you, you're distracted by having your hands wrapped, you got your headphones on, but that visual that visual of your friend going out to war and your next is a massive trigger point. So I talk about that being the first one. And then the second one I talk about them standing, um, they come out, they stand at the door and they've got their team around them and, and we do it and we're tapping them on each back and then listening and waiting for their music to kick. Um, and then I, I talk about, the, I get them to pick a part of the song that is their walk time. And it could be 30 seconds in the song, could be five seconds, but I always tell them, this is your walkout. No one's gonna rush you. You leave when you wanna go, as long as you go. <laughs> so I get them to think about the music and think about that part of the song the part of the song comes, it's could be a beat or something, the doors open, the lights are on, now you're in fight mode. Now you just want to go in there and do things, you're focused. And I tell them, this is how you're going to feel. You'll feel calm, focused and excited at this point. Your nerves will be gone. And it works. And then when this happens, they're waiting and waiting for these. And then, ah, music. And they're just like a robot. And then I talk about being completely focused at this point. And I, I always say to them, you know, if your friends and family and tell them to stay completely away from you until after your fight, because at that point, we want you as focused as possible. We don't want people coming high-fiving you. 
So all you do is look at the cage, nothing else. You walk straight to the cage, you get greased up in the cage, and then I talk about the eyes never leave the cage. They're always inside. If you're the first out in the blue team, then you crouch down and you listen, but you don't look because your eyes get distracted. You look down and you hear your corner, tune into your corner's voice. So you can hear that voice through all the noise. And if you're red, get in, do your ring, tune into your coach's voice. I always talk about one voice from the corner being really important. Have one person that you can tune into, listen to them, they talk to you from here, and then um, standing, ready to go. And the last trigger point I always talk about is you know, the announcements, eyes focused, looking at your opponent, staying relaxed, and then the camera goes out to so film our finales, and then you hear the cage door shut, and I say there's a metallic sound, and the bolt goes down. <laughs> down it's on. And then when I'm doing this with people, literally, I've done it talking, because I get them to do it, I go through the whole drill, and then sometimes we do visualization drills at the end of training, and where I get people crying in the group. They're so emotional. It's so yeah. It's so emotional, but that's the best thing. And I say to people, I want, I want that emotion because. Well, but that means that you actually make system. make the thing. You actually, exactly. you know, exactly. make your mind, you know, to believe that yes. in in reality it's, visualization. It's like that, that's anything. good. You can't. You have to draw your nervous system. Yeah. If it hasn't been there before, you're gonna have trouble controlling it. But if you can get those goosebumps, you get that tingling feeling. You get that sickness and you that emotion that you're preparing your nervous system and you do that every day in the lead up to the fight so when the fight comes it's okay i've been here so many times before and which when you're a pro fighter it's easier because you've done it so many times but when it's your first fight or oh, your yeah. second or third oh, yeah. this is so new so these the visualization drills is a massive part of what i do in these certain trigger points to get them mentally set to fight yeah yeah but well, uh, it's uh i don't know who, who I, i speak spoke with and uh explain how how i get involved in uh, in the mental training i actually like uh i, ha I had a resource to do that and i paid to to a, a, a sports psychologist to get involved with the team back in bulgaria it changes the game so much yeah. and uh, but it, and in the moment you realize it's actually a skill But you have to drill it. Yeah, every year. And uh, uh, especially sports psychology, you know, the, you don't need to understand so much. Mm. I mean, it's good, but you don't need to. It's the same like when you're a fighter, you don't need to understand the training processes or, or, uh, since you're doing it. Mm. But it, it, there's a drill that you just have to do them. Yeah. And uh, and one of the things that I learned from this lady, she was she was a lady, and she was pretty good in that. Uh, to uh. To make something a habit, you have to repeat two weeks yeah. every day, yeah. and then it becomes it becomes habit. So when and that's strongly related to any mental technique that you use, yeah. you have to do it at least two weeks in a row, yeah. and then you know it it becomes your technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Visualization. Yeah, yeah it's it's a massive part, and um, yeah, it's I've and I've seen and uh, so many times people come up to me at finale and coach. All that visualization, that, those trigger points. I didn't believe it when you were doing it. Oh my God, they made such a difference. I was like, oh, there you go. But yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, it's this, it's that same. Fighting's eighty percent mental, twenty percent. Absolutely. I actually think it's more ninety ten to be honest. I, I should so I, I times, should say nine ninety ten. Yeah. So many times you see these killers on the mat, and they beat everyone, and then they can't handle the pressure. They mentally they just fail, and the the guy that's getting tall can. Because he's getting tooled all the time and beaten, he's just mentally tougher. He'll win in a fight. Absolutely. Yeah. You, in, you know, with with the new guys that are trained, because the group here in Australia is, is quite new. And then you don't know yourself until your tenth fight. Yeah. Match or whatever. Yeah. You don't really know yourself. No. Because about the tenth fight, you actually start to realize what's going on, and then you actually start to. To really compete. Mm -hmm. Before that, you just like you go there, you just like, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, I remember the old UFCs. They had this like slogan: "I only saw swinging." <laughs> yeah. Of James Brown, and they just like you just you go, you just like yeah, and yeah. it's over, and like did they won? <laughs> did they won? <laughs> and then they didn't know what's yeah. going. Yeah, uh, let's just uh, speak a bit IMF. Yeah. Uh, we just finished a massive busy weekend. Yeah, yeah crazy. Yeah. It's still going on, you know. Yeah, like, I know. Coach Ed is still at the back. Yeah, <laughs> We're working with the with the level one coaches. Yeah. yeah so um, yeah, so um, 
from the outset, when I first went to um, Bahrain last year, I come back, I sat on the plane and I, I, on, my, on my laptop, I basically made these notes, all these things I wanted to accomplish um, in the first year. Um, and then I whiteboarded, I whiteboarded everything. And then tick, 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 cross off, you know, all these things. And first thing was to, um, is to build memberships, um, get more gyms and more students involved. Um, new syllabus stuff is a, is a, is a big um, help with that. Um, and then coaches, if you don't have coaches, you have nothing. Um, so the accredited coaching and then build the team. I mean, my, my big goal was to have 50 accredited coaches by the end of this year, which I'm, I'm pretty sure we will have. Um, and then next year's world, 2020, um, I want to be able to pay to fully fund a team of 20 to go to the world. Speaking about that, like uh, if any coaches are listening to that, mm. how do they actually like tune in and uh, like uh, get involved in IMF and uh, get on board and you know... Con contact me. Um, on social media, Richie Cranny or um, Richie at immafa.org.au, um and just get in touch. We're running coaching courses all around Australia. Um, Melbourne is next, then we're going to Brisbane, we go over to the West Coast. Um, once you become an accredited coach, you can run the syllabus, your students can then um, get involved with the, the federation, tournaments. We're, we're going to be running new map based tournaments as well as the cage. Um, I'm a big believer in that your first time you ever compete in mixed martial arts, as I know you do, shouldn't be in a cage, map based first. Absolutely. Um, so that's going to be a big part of, of this year, pushing that out. And then, yeah, just we, we want to get as many people involved as possible. Um, I mean, from a gym's point of view, it adds so much value. If they become an accredited gym, accredited coaching, it's much better for their gym and their, their, um, their reputation. We're, we're, have all their details on our website. Their students can be part of our, our ecosystem with their, with the syllabus based um, um, belt system with MMA now, which is a global um, system, the coaches, and then they've got this pathway of competition, which really has been unknown in Australia. And the, uh, like, I personally like being coaching, being interesting, but all that myself, a lot from the sports science, I was actually amazed by the uh, when Andrew was here on the first coaching course uh, with the with the knowledge that back up the whole system yeah. of IMF and it was like and when you meet Andrew it's like man you have I have so much to learn you know? yeah Just I know like, how nice is that from a coach's point of view yeah it's it's yeah. and and then you you have this. Uh, drive back you know just to catch up and just to yeah. to become good in that because yeah. you actually see that these guys are already good in that and like yeah. because as a coach i i crave the competition part because mm. i love to compete yeah but when when i have the challenge like i was like i want to be good yeah. you know like i cannot let these guys be better than me like in yeah. In, but but the 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 knowledge that andrew provides with the uh, with uh, with his like I had pretty good coaches, and mm. I'm thankful for all of that. But when you meet guy like Andrew, or like yeah. who looking at the combo sport from the from the perspective of science, you're like, man, they you, so you don't much. even yeah. you don't even know that their level of that understanding of combo sport. You're like, damn, there's so much. Yeah, it's, look, I mean, that that's that's a, a massive part. I mean, you students are only as good as a coach. You know, we want to bring coaches up, you know, educate them. Um, you know, get a lot of sports science behind them, real understanding and, and just grow the sport. And I think it's such an exciting time to, for Australian MMA. And, you know, end of this year, we'll have 50 accredited MMA coaches around Australia. Um, level one, we've got level two, we're going to have our first black belts um, under the IMAF system by the end of this year because um, we're having a fast track system. So, um, which means basically, um, this year, 2019, people that the coaches are able to put their students to a, a position in the syllabus where they are most relevant. So someone that's been training three years shouldn't be a white belt in yeah. MMA. So bringing them up to speed and you know putting them forward to, to be fast track and the same with the coaches. So by the end of this year, everyone is sitting where they should be, um, which is really cool. Um, and then the big one for me is securing the Oceanas next year and having it on the Gold Coast. Um, and if it goes well, we should have it for two or three years. Um, and, you know, I, I want to have at least 100 people competing on that for us. I think there's no reason why we won't. And this is why today, you know, we're doing these talent scouting days. 
because really our biggest hurdle is is um, people actually knowing what we do. You know, we don't have, we're a non-for-profit, we don't have thousands of dollars to spend on marketing and social media advertising. Um, we have to, it's all, it's all word of mouth. So by getting in front of these young athletes that are, that are hungry, you know, and want to be in, in, in the sport and explaining the pathways available um, and saying to, you know, imagine, I mean, back in the day, there was, there, when I first started competing, if someone had said to me, you can represent your country as an amateur mixed martial arts and go overseas, I'd be like, this is the best thing ever. But this is what's available now. These guys can go to Bahrain, they can go to Rome, they go to the Bahamas, go to Bangkok and represent their country and win medals. It's insane. But people don't know about it. Yeah, so, it's it's nothing based by by the feeling when you're on 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 the on, on the first 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 step on the stairs. Yeah. And uh, you hear the national autumn that is played because of you. There's nothing better than yeah, that. Like nice. that's the best thing ever yeah. you can ever achieve. I'm really happy I had the chance to do that yeah, because of the cool. the fun. But it's like, and you actually realize because of you. Yeah. But you don't need for yourself, you need for your, your country, for your people, yeah. and for your family, everything. It's just like, yeah, I did that, you know, yeah. like... And there's no money, there's no... Price, no, 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 about the money, just that's the, what I mean. the that's feeling. Like, it's pure. It's the pure sport. It's, pure sport, it's, yeah. It's, you're there because you love what you do, and you want to be good at it, and you want to represent your country, you know, and it's, it's the purest form of the sport. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's no one drinking in the stands and there's, Absolutely, it's yeah. just, it, everyone's there because they want to be there and they're passionate about MMA. And I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's um, like I said, right at the beginning, it's a real passion play for me now. Um, I want to be on that list of people that got the sport into Olympics. I want to build the Australian team up. I want to build the team like yourself and, you know, get Brian involved, you know, Ed's already here and he's amazing. We need more Ed's. We need more people. You know, and um, we, we, we're only going to get bigger and we're only going to get stronger. And the Oceanus is my my focus. What's your impression about the guys that turned out today? I thought they were really cool. The the thing for me, um, and it's it's always my, and people that know me go, oh, shut up. Same thing <laughs> over and over again. It's because I have this thing that you should train for MMA if you're doing MMA. You know, I understand. Go for that. But the, every, almost every person I talk to, because I have, I interviewed, I had to interview, I ask a few questions just on video. So we've got a database of people to pull from. And I ask them name, age, your gym, your coach, and tell me your training regime. What do you do on a weekly basis? Almost all of them. I do Jiu Jitsu Monday, Tuesday. I do Muay Thai Wednesday, Thursday. And I'm like, okay. And I, I didn't talk to them then because this is stuff, but they're, they're not going to do well on the international scene if their their training is is fractured and there's no you have to combine it's you have to be seamless you need to be able to control distance work angles defend takedowns work clinch and you need to be able to strike on the ground no offense to any other combat sport or art but mma is style by itself yeah absolutely and uh uh the downside of uh, training at like separate di the disciplines mm. that is uh, that are involved in them are separate, uh, and 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 no no wrong no much wrong with that because they even UFC guys that still doing that. Sure. But what happens is and you but the thing is uh, it, with the even with UFC guys you can see that they have switches. Yeah. So they have like striking switch. So now I strike. Then he switches to wrestling. But then he stops striking because he switches to wrestling. Yeah. Then he 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 took he he like he's taken down or he he took someone down, and then you see like the grappling or like BJ yeah. switch turn on. There is no ground and pound. So yeah. And if you if you if you know that and working on fights, even you see, you see that these guys actually train the discipline separate. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, in 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 the in the late years. There's there's big rise of these guys, the young ones, the new generation, the, the new generation who who train yeah. MMA as a, as a yeah. separate sport, and you see guys like that, they are wiping the legends, which is which is hmm. sad because yeah. uh, the cool thing with these old legends and with uh, the style versus style, it's style and they has this uh, uh, they has this uh, something that they do and is so recognizable. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, like Vanderlei Silva, like technical yeah. bro, and like uh, 
uh, all these like yeah. big grabber. Yeah. But these guys, the downside is like they look the same. Yeah. Like of course with small twitches of the side, but they have this full side, yeah. full way rounded game, and they don't really care. Yeah. Like uh, doesn't matter where the doesn't matter where the fight goes. It's 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 yeah. just just stream and make game. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's the next generation. Right? That's, that's the generation it. That, that's now. the involvement of sport. Yeah. That's the that's yeah. the next next level. And that that's what the you know the guys over here like. They, if they get on the international circuit and they go overseas and they go up against Eastern Europeans or even the American teams and stuff, where they're just pure MMA, they they, they will get exposed. Look, you can get someone that's got an amazing ground game. Of and course, if he can get it to the ground, he of might course. get a submission. Of but course, it's he's going to be very the next fight. As Ed was saying earlier, his coaches are going to be watching. The, his next opponent's coach is going to watch that and he's going to no, know he's one dimensional. Just keep it on your feet, work your wrestling and just strike. And, and he's going to get beaten. You can't have these holes in your games anymore. And this, so this is my thing is we need to just, it's a mentality. And, and as I said to the guys, we're not saying don't do jujitsu. We're not saying don't, but no, when you're doing it, do it for MMA. You can train, you can posture, you can put your head in a position. Yeah, have the, 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 mentality. the mentality that you train yes. in your mind when you're doing like... Top game, always defending strikes even if they're not there. Don't sit up with your chin exposed, you know. Look for opportunities to strike even if you're not doing them. So your brain is constantly tr thinking about these things. And, and that's and the same with the wrestling as well. And um, the, the hardest thing... Every about, aspect, every yeah, aspect. Absolutely, absolutely. Every aspect. Some, some you can kind of work with and some... The, the, the biggest thing for me is uh, with Muay Thai, is people train Muay Thai, I think that, but there's so many different variations with Muay Thai, the, the distance, the hand position, the, the stance, it, it's, it's very easy to, a wrestler will just tear a Muay Thai, traditional Muay Thai guy apart, but that's still accepted as doing striking for MMA, and it's not. So, um, yeah, the biggest thing for me is, is getting that mentality of, train you could because you can go in a muay thai class and you just adopt an mma stance have your hand in position for mma and just think about always being ready for takedown so when you finish you don't stand still you cut corners and you remove your hips all the things you don't do in in muay thai and i think if we can get that message across um the team will just really really flourish and and get the coaches on board with it as well yeah uh that's that was that was cool so just to make a quick switch back to wimp to warrior yeah uh there's uh there's problem starting gold coast yeah uh like uh gold could, coast sunshine coast how well. yeah. yeah sunshine coast. how people can can get on board on that and give give it a try this this so go to wimp um when you go on wimp warrior.com you'll see a map of the world you just go to australia click um the Queensland buttons and you'll see Brisbane, Sunshine, Gold Coast, click the relative one, you can register online um, and we're having tryouts over the next few weeks. Um, amazing series, something people will never ever forget. Um, if you train in MMA, you can still do it, you know, as long as you haven't competed at amateur level. Um, if you've done a bit of Jiu Jitsu, a bit of Muay Thai, that's fine, it's not just purely for beginners, um, but it's an amazing way to experience the life of a fighter for five months um so yeah get on the website sign up awesome uh i'll put links on that on cool Henry, so like people will, will be able you know, to know yeah. and if you sign up i'll come and see you <laughs> <laughs> and uh okay the last question what is worth fighting for what is worth fighting for yeah uh, for you for me uh well, for your perspective what is worth fighting that's a very general question so you can you can go wide <laughs> it's for me it's easy family you know this if something if anyone ever threatened my family then i don't care that's for me that's that's yeah uh, that's it but it did uh, look fighting is so general i mean absolutely yeah i mean it's that's the point so yeah I, I fight for everything tricky you know? question <laughs> I, I fight for the sport every day you know i'm always trying to sell mma you know well, honestly we were thankful for you for you doing that because uh, you, since you get involved in uh, mmf in australia you just things start happening it's like uh, like uh, this like avalanche you know like it, yeah. you on board but you're try, trying to catch up and you have to do all this stuff but it's yeah. it's it just the excitement behind it is just uh, it's just amazing and like you're happy to do that in the same time you're tired you have so much things to do and then you fall asleep and you wake up in the morning the first thing is like i still have to do this stuff it's just 
it's yeah. just so crazy. It's just amazing time for the sport, and yeah, I, I think it's it's, it's, it's it's a passion play for me. It is. It's, it's it's um if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. So I get as much from it as the people that you know I'm I'm helping to to grow. So it's a, it's I guess you can see it as a selfish thing as well. So I do it because I love it. So and and I do and I think this time next year this. Australian amateur MMA IMAF will be in a completely different way because people like yourself, you know, a massive asset for the sport. Thank you. Brian, you know, just finding some real talent, coaches and students and, and even just people that want to help, you know. When people see that other people are getting behind and excited, it attracts people. Like It's, attracts it, like. it's crazy vibe. It's crazy yeah. vibe. All the team, you know, like Coach Ed, you know, Brian, yeah. there's so much amazing people involved in that. Yeah. Yourself, of course. Yeah. It's just like, it's just, I, I, I personally, I'm, I just feel blessed to be part of that because you know when something great is happening, you feel it. Yeah. And when you're part of it, you, you, you vibrate with it, you feel that it's, it's, it's going on and part of it. And, and as you said, the Olympic dream of the, you yeah. know, like that's, you know, that's, yeah. and, and one day you, 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 you just say, I was actually part of that. Yeah. You know, like Crazy. seeing and watching the Emmy Olympics, yeah. that's that, that's yeah. going to be amazing. And, you know, there's other things. I want, to, I want to see an Australian win the gold medal. That can happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Know? No, we're all for yeah, that. We spoke that many times. For sure, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to happen. We, you know? we, we, not, not, yeah. It's not only possible. We're going to do that. Yeah. We'll do that. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many cool things that we can do. So, yeah. But thank you. Thank you for this. Awesome. This Thanks for all, that. So Everything helps. No? Thank Cheers. You. Thanks for that. Always uh -huh. a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Fight Is All podcast. Subscribe in your podcast app to receive the next episode when I will meet you with the IMFA national team coach of Australia who have the experience from amateur competitions on local international level up to the UFC cage. The walking personification of the world toughness, coach Ed Bavilok. Mm -hmm.